So let me say first a little something about the BMCS. Um, the Biological and Medicinal Chemistry Sector, the BMCS, uh, is a large and lively group of the Royal Society of Chemistry. It exists at the interface of academia and industry. And also we seek to promote uh, interest in biological and medicinal chemistry of all kinds. Um, we organise meetings, uh, a large number of these every year, and seek to promote uh, a number of uh, educational events uh, within universities and within schools also. And uh, perhaps about three years ago, I think we were uh, talking about ways in which we might uh, extend our activities a little further, and I suggested the idea of a BMCS lectureship. We're very happy to say that the committee thought this was a good idea, and uh, really tonight's lecture and uh, last year's lecture by uh, <coughs> uh, Mike Waring of AstraZeneca are the direct result. So we invited applications for the lectureship uh, about two years ago, and um, the response was extremely strong, I have to say. And, uh, so we're then in the uh, pleasant but very difficult position of having to choose between some really excellent candidates. And the ones we chose in the end were, we've made a joint appointment. And I think this reflects the uh, interest, as I say, we have of keeping a balance between academia and industry. So the position was held by Mike Waring of AstraZeneca last year, and now Barry Potter will take that position over for academic year 2015 and 16. And during that time, he'll deliver a number of lectures at universities through the country. So let me now introduce Barry himself. Uh, Barry and I met uh, so a very long time ago at Oxford, and uh, he completed his first degree there in 1977, and his uh, DPhil under Gordon Lowe in 1981. He then uh, did a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Göttingen in Germany, and became the lecturer in biological chemistry at Leicester in 1984. Following that, he became professor of medicinal and biological chemistry at the University of Bath in 1990, and he has held that position until this year, <coughs> when he took up a chair at the University of Oxford. Barry has won a large number of prizes, and he became a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences in 2008. So last year, um, Mike gave very much the uh, pharmacological angle on drug discovery. I think Barry's talk tonight will be particularly interesting. He's going to talk about the uh, university experience. Just what can universities contribute to drug discovery? There's never been greater need. One of our primary objectives in the BMCS through establishing this lectureship was to inspire the next generation of uh, young chemists to show them what could be achieved in this way. And so now I invite Barry to give his talk entitled Drug Discovery in a University, Fact or Fiction? Barry. Well, thank you, Andrew. That's very kind of your introduction, and thanks to all of you for coming tonight, because I know there are many other things going on, on outside today, and I thought we might have a, a smattering of people, but it's fantastic to see a full house here. So as Andrew has said, I'm going to talk about some of our adventures in drug discovery, but very much from an academic perspective. And uh, although I'm now uh, at this place, much of the work I'll talk about was carried out at the University of Bath. So in terms of structure, I'll start off talking about the need for new drugs. It's absolutely critical we have lots of new drugs at the moment. I think that's very clear. Big pharma and the blockbuster mentality. Targeted therapies and genetic revolution. And big problems about the old way of discovering drugs. Medicinal chemistry, we're in the RSC, so it's about medicinal chemistry at the very heart of the drug discovery process. Um, how it was done in the past and what the modern methods are of doing it now. Very important to compare. Uh, the advent of structure-based design, which is how we do it in the main. And really, university drug discovery, conflicts, translational aspects, patenting, and spin-outs, and I'll refer to our own work in this section. The valley of death, a very terrible thing to deal with in the drug discovery field especially if you're not in big pharma. And the changing landscape of drug discovery and how new partnership models can influence that. And then finally, some conclusions. So I love this um, quote here from the, the actor and playwright Moliere, the Frenchman, doctors pour drugs of which they know little to cure diseases of which they know less into patients of whom they know nothing. And Moliere was famous, obviously, as a hypochondriac. And he had many clashes with, with medical profession, I think, 
in his time. So he was speaking from, from some personal knowledge here. But drugs of which they know little, how things have changed since the 17th century. We know the molecular structure of our drugs. We can design our drugs to do certain things. We know a lot about them. Very, very different to them. To cure diseases of which they know less. We know now about the structural biology of diseases, pathogens, uh, important targets that we can hit uh, in our drug discovery process. We know the molecular structure of the enemy, and that's very, very important too. And finally, into patients of whom they know nothing. We're in the middle now of the genetic revolution in targeted therapy. We're starting to understand much, much more about the personal genetics of, of ourselves and how we can exploit this genetics to give us targeted therapy which is designed for us and not for everyone because we know that one size doesn't necessarily fit all. That being said, in terms of progression from the 17th century, the odds on successfully developing a drug, even now, are almost universally acknowledged as daunting. And that's a big feature of my talk. It's very, very hard to do this. Many of you may have read this book by Ben Goldacre. Many may have a rather jaded and cynical view of the pharma industry that may or may not be justified. I don't want to say so today. But it, it goes without saying that new drugs for unmet medical needs must be invented somehow. The process takes 10 to 15 years. It costs about one to two billion dollars. And as I said, is characterized by a very low chance of success. And in recent years, we've relied on, on big pharma to do drug discovery and they are finding it harder and harder to do this and keep their business model going. So if big pharma can't discover drugs, what on earth are we to do? And I'll give three examples of the need for new drugs. One of the biggest is new antibiotics. Picture a world where a cut finger could kill you. You don't have to look far. Only 100 years ago, a quarter of all deaths were due to bacterial infections. We're in the middle of a crisis of antibiotic therapy. There have been no new classes of antibiotics discovered since the 1980s. More money must be pumped into global drug research. Otherwise, these drug-resistant infections will kill millions of people. Uh, by 2050, 10 million people perhaps, uh, more of them currently die from cancer. The global cost may be around uh, $100 trillion. This is a big problem and we need to act now. We're all getting older, I think that goes without saying, and with this comes the threat of these types of diseases of the brain. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, and other type diseases. There are very large numbers of sufferers now already. This is set to increase still further as we all get older and older and older. If left unchecked within 30 years, more than 12 million Americans will suffer from such diseases. We must find drugs. We don't have them at the moment. Uh, a very um, recent thing, quite close to home in some respects, it's been in the news for a long time, the Ebola outbreak in Africa, very serious. It's now being checked. If it hadn't have been checked, who knows what might have happened. So thankfully, there are drugs being explored in various trials uh, by medicinal chemists who are starting to discover ways of discovering uh, antiviral agents that might help in, in such cases. But we always have to be vigilant for the arrival of new and old pathogens to threaten us. It's a never-ending fight. So here's a quote from uh, Jean-Pierre Garnier, who used to be CEO of GlaxoSmithKline, the big pharma company. Developing drugs is a tricky business. It's more difficult to discover and develop a new drug than to put a rocket on the moon. And it also costs more money. That's a pretty stark statement. That was made a, a few years ago. <coughs> It's got worse since then. It's not got better. It's a big crisis in the pharma industry, 
that the whole world industry is trying now to deal with and find new models to tackle. So it's important to discover new drugs. It's getting harder. The key people who are doing it are finding it very, very difficult. And here's the process uh, laid out a bit. It starts with uh, the work of the chemist. Uh, at this stage, lots of compounds designed or randomly generated. Drug research turns into preclinical research to whittle it down into a smaller number. And then we have clinical trials, phase one, phase two, and phase three trials in human, perhaps less than five compounds. And if you're lucky, you get to a drug approved by the FDA in America after perhaps 10 to 15 years. And then there are phase four studies to explore it in, in the population. Cost greater than a billion euro, greater than a billion dollars, perhaps two billion dollars in some cases. High risk, high attrition rate, and of course chemistry is right at the start here. And the very sad thing is, even if you get to this stage, in late stage clinical trials, you still have an alarmingly high chance of failure. So human clinical trials are the way by which we explore new drug entities, phase one, phase two, and phase three. Phase three is safety uh, in humans, safety and dose perhaps, and often in healthy volunteers. Phase two, you start to look at the efficacy of the drug, how it's working, is it working at all, in, in a more um, anecdotal fashion. And phase three are the big trials where you do double blind studies against the standard of care if there is one. Uh, and finally, if you're lucky, you get the drug approved. If you're in oncology where we are, you can progress straight to patients in phase one, which is a certain advantage. But I want to draw your attention here to the costs. Phase one, one million. Phase two, 10 million. Phase three, 100 million. So it's almost impossible for anyone but a very large pharma company to do trials at this stage. And the chance of success is still only about 50%. These are very damning figures to deal with. You invest 100 million at this stage and you might fail half of the time. Where's this done? It's done in Big Pharma. Now, Big Pharma, of course, is a, a name for the whole global pharma industry. You'll recognize some of these names here as being very well known. They appear in pharmacies on your medicines all the time. Uh, and we may or may not respect them. We may accuse them of overpricing our drugs, of being profit hungry, but they have a very hard task to deal with, a very hard task indeed. They have to make profits. They have to reinvest those profits in the enormous cost of designing new drugs. But what you don't normally think of uh, in this game is a university. Big Pharma has worked on a certain model for many years. It's called the blockbuster model. Um, and a blockbuster is essentially a billion dollar drug, a drug that sells a billion dollars every year. And Big Pharma has worked on this idea and tried to produce lots and lots of blockbuster drugs to keep the model going. And that's been fine for a long time, but now they're getting ever harder to discover and market. So the old concept of a blockbuster has been uh, one drug to treat one disease that affects a large population. And ideally, you want to, uh, to treat this population chronically so people are always uh, buying your drug. But it's fine when you get to billion dollar drugs, but of course, one development path in 10 that gets to clinical trials will succeed. 90% of all clinical trials undertaken will fail. And this is the terrible thing. And you still get to the 100 million stage and you only have a 40 to 50% chance of success. Cancer is our area in particular, and cancer is obviously uh, another major area uh, of the pharma industry. In fact, it's one of the biggest areas currently being produced uh, by the industry. 
14 million adults were diagnosed with cancer in 2012, 8.2 million deaths. The cost of this is enormous. Even in 2007, the costs in the US were estimated at about $78 billion for dealing with this disease. Uh, President Nixon declared a war on cancer many years ago, and progress is being made, often in a big way, but the cost personally and the cost financially is still enormously high. But there's some very good news on the cancer front. Big progress is being made. You can cure many cancers by surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation uh, if you start early enough. Genetic screening now can warn of a predisposition to cancer. So you can start to be warned about a tendency to cancer and perhaps act accordingly to stop that. Gleevec is this drug down here. And here is a famous example of a recently developed drug of a targeted nature. It's one of the new class of drugs which targets certain proteins involved in cancer. And it does so in a way that's very different to the chemotherapy we often hear about where you have hair loss, toxicity, and all the horrible things of standard drugs. So this is a new member of a, a, a new class of agent which is very, very important now. There are first drugs appearing now against melanoma. There are new vaccines against cancer-causing viruses. So a lot of progress is being made and the pharma industry is investing vast amounts of money in new cancer therapies. And many of these discoveries are being made at the interface of chemistry and biology. Here's a good example. This very complex drug here, mertansine, is a, a, a natural product. It's extremely toxic. You can't take it without severe toxicity. So uh, it's been cleverly attached to an antibody, a biological molecule that recognizes certain uh, motifs on cells. And this can be used to target this very toxic drug to a tumor. Here's the tumor in brown. And here's the antibody here in green. And these bright sparks here are mertansine that's been linked to this antibody. So what this does is it directs the drug to your tumor. It means you can use a very low dose. It means your drug can be very toxic and it doesn't matter in the same way. You get a targeted therapy that goes to your tumor and it doesn't have other toxicity. So very, very important uh, idea. And this is taking uh, a lot of root now as a new type of therapy. So this is Capsila, <coughs> which is a major advance in cancer therapy, but it may be too expensive. If you compare this graph here over the years from 65 to 15, you'll see the cost of cancer drugs, the monthly cost at the time of approval is going up inexorably, reflecting the enormous cost of development of these drugs and perhaps just the smaller targeted populations of patients. And there's been a big crisis recently. The NHS has rejected this treatment with many others. It costs about £90,000 per patient. Uh, and after the review, which was uh, last year, it was reconsidered and the drug is still available, but many others are not. So it's an enormous difficult thing to measure the, the value of a few more months of life against the very high costs of designing these new agents, 90,000 pounds per patient. This is a tough equation to try and balance. And there are very extreme examples. This year, uh, a couple of years ago, um, this drug, Savaldi, from Gilead, that's shown here, was approved as a cure for hepatitis C. It costs $84,000 per course of treatment. In the year after launch, Savaldi generated $10 billion of sales. And in the next few years, it's projected to generate $40 billion of sales. It's one of the most successful drugs ever discovered. But it costs Gilead, the company, $11 billion to acquire the drug. They bought a biotech company, and they paid $11 billion. Now it's paying off. They've got it approved. 
They've made 10 billion in the first year, and they'll make a lot more. But look at the sums involved. When they bought this drug, it had not been approved. They could have poured $10 billion down the drain if something had gone wrong. And the US, in particular, is very concerned about the pricing of these drugs with, with some justification. Are they becoming too expensive to discover? This is a big thing. Curing hepatitis C is a big thing. And one has to also think about the cost of not curing hepatitis C uh, and, and what that means too. But it's a difficult equation. And here's a, a, a very depressing graph. <coughs> the trend in R&D efficiency over the years from 1950. It's down, down, down all the time. And these are number of drugs per billion dollars of spending. So more and more money is being pushed in, less and less is coming out of the pipeline. That's really sad and very depressing. Even the ex-president of the RSC said it's a fact that the easy targets in the body for production of drugs have essentially all been used up. That's a very depressing fact. But even more depressing is pharma doesn't feel they are innovative, they're not productive enough, um, they have a broken model, there's less innovation than there should be, there's also the patent cliff. So you make these blockbusters, you can sell them for some years and make a lot of money, the patent then dies down and you don't make your money anymore. They can be sold generically. So lots of things are contributing to the demise of the big pharma business model. Here's more stark, even up to 2004, this is an FDA report. Money going in, drugs being approved. It's the wrong direction. More money goes in, less comes out. Very depressing. So what's happened recently is pharma has been reorganizing itself to try and deal with this crisis. They've been laying off staff. Big job losses. You've heard about Pfizer, AstraZeneca, thousands of people have been laid off. They've sold off um, non-core ventures, they've closed labs, they're taking lots of steps to deal with this crisis. And they're replacing these operations by forming partnerships with academic labs and uh, trying to encourage biotech companies to take over the risky early stage development and then they can buy these biotech companies perhaps for $11 billion, but it's a difficult model. So I think you'd be very advised to feel about the whole thing like this. That's how I feel about it. It's horrific. This is this famous painting by Edvard Munch, The Scream. And I like this particular um, picture here, which won a prize. It's from the University of Dundee. And you can see the similarity. These are microtubules. These are important filaments of the cell structure, which I'll talk about later on. And they've obviously decided to fold up in a way mimicking the scream. So when biology does this, you start to worry. Perhaps they feel the same way about it. So it's a terrible situation to be in. So we should be very depressed. Or should we? There are some silver linings coming through. 2003 was the sequencing of the human genome, a landmark paper in nature. And that, of course, was the structure that's the sequence of the DNA in our chromosomes. We don't know everything about this DNA yet, but the information is there. And I think with the advent of the idea of personalized medicine, of personal therapies which are targeted to you, this is a fantastic time to be involved in the drug discovery process. In terms of science, the commercial side is more tricky, but the science is very, very exciting. Uh, even President Obama, in his budget for 2006, is giving a $215 million investment to the NIH for working on this idea of precision medicine. So it's a very big area of interest, and even governments are investing in this <coughs> important area. And there are good reasons why they should do that, because these therapies should be tailored to you. 
And I think it's been over many, many years, groups of patients have been treated with drugs regardless of whether these drugs are any good for them. And as you see, patients are heterogeneous. They consist of lots of different types of people and races, different genetic makeups. And one given drug doesn't fit all. So you're treating these patients with a drug and you may be wasting your money and causing them undue suffering because they won't respond. And the whole attraction of pharmacogenetics, as it's called, is to take these patients and split them into groups, responding subpopulations, people who might find the drug toxic, and only treat the group of patients who will show a response. Not only do you spare people um, a lot of anguish if they don't respond to the drug, you also save money because you're not wasting the drug on patients where there's no chance of a response. So it's obvious why this should be the case, and here's some good reasons uh, which from everyday life why it's obvious. Um, but it's the new type of approach, the new model, but it may mean less profit for the pharma industry because they don't sell drugs for everyone, they sell drugs for a certain cohort of people which will be smaller. But the important thing is that you can measure some marker in these people that will tell you they will respond. And that's very, very important. It's very important for the NHS to be able to do that, for example, and be seen not to waste money. A very famous case, uh, uh, very much in the news recently, has been Angela Jolie. And Angela Jolie has gone very public about her recent surgery that has tried to uh, mitigate her risk, her inherited risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer because she has inherited in her family uh, the BRCA1 gene which give rise to the BRCA1 protein. This is a protein that repairs damaged DNA and in this situation it's itself damaged and doesn't work properly. So she's done a great service in essentially drawing attention to the idea that our genetics play a very important role in uh, future disease. And what can we do about it? But of course, we're in the Royal Society of Chemistry. I'm a chemist, and I believe that chemistry uh, is very important for drug discovery and must be pushed very hard. I love this quote here. It annoys my biology colleagues all the time. It was made by John Jacob Bacillius in the 19th century. He was a very famous <coughs> Swedish chemist. And I think it's coming true. Chemistry is at the heart of drug discovery and it's achieving some amazing things. But what's happening now, uh, especially as exemplified by this quote here, it's chemistry in combination with other areas. It's the interface between disciplines which is really driving drug discovery. And this was the uh, statement for the Nobel Prize awarded last year. Biology has turned to chemistry. Chemistry has turned into biology. And I think that just epitomizes where we stand. Um, in 2015, with lots of different uh, areas coming together to form a coherent interdisciplinary whole which can solve the big problems that we're faced with. So medicinal chemistry is, is the key, I think, to many, many things. And it's not just a science, it's an art. If it was technical alone, it would be easy to discover drugs. It's not. The science is very powerful and offers a great hope for mankind to improve quality of life. But the art is challenging. There's no simple way to discover drugs. There are certain paths you can take but you need intuition and experience. And of course, you're up against enormous failure rates. And here are a few techniques from my own lab, the kind of instruments that we use uh, in our work. And amusingly, here's a, a picture of this very room. The colors seem slightly different, but this was a conference held only a few months ago, Mastering MedChem. And I put this up because there was this amusing 
little uh, rejoinder here. There are two types of drug discovery programs, those that hit serious problems and those that are going to hit serious problems. So that's another bleak statement, but it's not an excuse not to start. Um, but of course, if you're a chemist and you are rising to the challenge, you will find ways around these problems. But it's a sobering thought that there are about 10 to the 65 possible drug-like compounds in theory, but only 10 to the 8 of these exist at the moment. So a great deal of chemical space that hasn't been explored. I think that MedChem, as we call it, should become increasingly a discipline in university. It's been intellectualized in a big way recently. It belongs also in university, not just in the pharma industry. But once you start to do that, you run into academic snobbery. And that's just epitomized here in a very bleak way, I think, too. I love this also because it really annoys my biology colleagues even more. <laughs> biology is just applied chemistry. But the physicists are even worse. And these guys are much, much worse. So this is increasing purity of the science. But it doesn't matter because we are at the interface. We are here between different subjects. And we need to get on with our colleagues in these different areas. We need to have personal chemistry with these people to be successful. It's not enough to be in your silo and just be a chemist. You have to interact. So this talk is supposed to be for um, a variety of people, the educated layman, some chemists, some are not. So forgive me for these two slides where I just uh, go through very quickly some of the basics of uh, structure to ensure that everyone can read from the same hymn sheet. Benzene, of course, you've heard of benzene. It's this six-ring molecule here with six carbons and six protons. It can be abbreviated like this. It can be abbreviated in different ways, ball and stick model, electrostatic model, and shape. Here's one of the most fundamental molecules of organic chemistry. Take a step away from that to a molecule we all can experience, adrenaline. Adrenaline has a benzene ring here and here. It also has oxygen. It also has nitrogen. And there's our molecule that gets you going if you need fight or flight. And down here is the structure. And this R here at that site means this is a chiral center. So there are two configurations also. This molecule has stereochemistry. So it has right and left-handed forms, which are non-superimposable. And only this one, the R1, is the active one in your body. So up here, we have a tetrahedral carbon. And when you have four groups around this carbon, as is shown here, you can have non-superimposable mirror images, the right and left-handed molecules. And they will interact in a different way with a biological drug target. So you have to have the right shape of these molecules to be a, a drug against a certain target. Here's a well-known drug, penicillin G. As you see, it's got a benzene ring. It's got different rings here. It's now got oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. It's also got stereochemistry. And here's the relationship in terms of ball and stick. So these are the types of complex drugs that we're dealing with. And they interact with biology. Now, biology, of course, is just applied chemistry, as I've said. So here is biology. The whole of biology is laid out on this slide. You start with amino acids. There are uh, amino acids which have this structure. They are right and left-handed. As we know, there's only one handedness for life, and there are unnatural amino acids. And they <coughs> polymerize to form a polypeptide, and this long chain of amino acids can fold into a protein. And here's some of the proteins that we've worked on recently in different forms, folded up very nicely. And uh, when they fold up, they fold up into helices, held together by hydrogen bonds or into beta sheets. And all of these form the 
architecture of proteins, such as hemoglobin, for example, which you can see here. This is the hemoglobin that makes your blood red. And this carries oxygen, but these proteins are enzymes. They catalyze reactions and make them go faster. And when these uh, chains fold up to form the 3D structure, they form an active site, which is the basis of catalysis. So molecules have to bind here to be turned over by the enzyme. So you need a substrate, and that has to fit into the active site of your enzyme, like a hand in a glove or a lock in a key, and then it works. So you might want to then decide this is a target for a drug. I'll design a molecule to fit in that site in a different way, and then you might have a drug. Where did it start? In cancer therapy, I think it's well recognized that cancer therapy started in the 1940s with the recognition that a terrible agent from the First World War, mustard gas, could be engineered by chemists to be therapeutically important. We all know what happened then, the horrible death that people died of uh, when they were uh, sufferers of mustard gas. But in the Second World War, looking for antidotes because they were still afraid of the use of these gases, they noticed that people who suffered from mustard gas poisoning had much reduced white cells, and they discovered that essentially this was killing off white cells. And they thought perhaps then perhaps it could be used, harnessed as an anti-cancer agent. And indeed, that's what happened. Here's mustard gas. And what it does is it forms this ring here, which is very reactive. And then <coughs> that can react with your DNA. And it can do that twice. So it reacts once. And then it happens again to form another ring. And it reacts twice. And what happens is it cross-links your DNA. Here's your strand of DNA with the two helices wrapped around each other. It links together these two strands. So the DNA cannot come apart to be engaged in uh, genetic replication. So what could be done is that this mustard gas could be modified chemically, so we've replaced here this yellow sulfur with a blue nitrogen and added on something else, as shown here, to form chlorambucil, which is an anti-cancer drug still used today. So it's a sobering thought to think that mustard gas, this terrible agent, through the skill of the organic chemist and intuition has produced an anti-cancer drug, which is still in use today. And then we saw in the 50s and 60s the dawn of rational drug discovery. You can't rely on serendipity for this intellectual pursuit of drug discovery. And the famous scientist James Black, who won the Nobel Prize, really coined the idea that drug molecules must be purposely built. They mustn't be made and then screened randomly. You have to have an idea. You have to prove that the target, if modulated by some agent, has a therapeutic value. The target is a druggable target. And he produced two very well-known drugs, clopanolol for heart disease, a beta blocker, and cimetidine, which is used for gastric acid secretion. And this was the dawn of rational drug design. Very, very important in terms of overall development of the discipline. But along the way, also, natural products have played their role as well. So molecules discovered from nature have proved to be very important. Here's one called Taxol, or Paclitaxel. And if you have breast cancer, you almost invariably take this drug by infusion. And this drug is actually isolated from the bark of this tree the Pacific U, and you can see it's a very complex molecule with lots of rings and lots of different atoms arranged in, in complex stereochemistry. It's not sustainable. You can't extract this from Pacific bark forever and then uh, keep going. You can't do it. You've got to find some way to uh, make it producible on a, on a, a big scale and sustainable. And it's hard to synthesize from scratch. So the solution was that um, scientists discovered from English yew, from the leaves of English yew, 
as shown here, they could extract this part of the molecule, which is very similar, not exactly the same, but very similar to this one, and they could tack on using chemistry this part here, which is similar to that one. So they use semi-synthetic work to take a more renewable source and use chemistry to make the drug docetaxel, which is a very good substitute for taxol. So natural products have been very important over the years in defining um, many drug molecules. Ever since Friedrich Wöhler in, in uh, the 19th century showed that you could turn ammonium uh, uh, isocyanate into urea, and this does not mean that these biological molecules have some mysterious force. You can change inorganic chemicals into organic chemicals. Chemists have made lots of compounds to explore as potential drugs, often for their own intrinsic value. But now, large libraries can be made. You can take a computer program and, in a few simple steps, produce large libraries of diverse molecules that you can then screen against your drug target. And this has been very important, too, in anti-cancer drug design. One of the key things which has helped this over the years has been this lady here, Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks was an American who, who died of cervical cancer in 1951. Um, her tissue was taken, as was the case in those days, without permission of the family. And what scientists found was that her cervical cancer cells could survive and multiply at a very, very high rate. Normally, cells in culture die after a few rounds. These go on and on and on. And it's been estimated that since 1951, 20 tons of these cells have been produced in terms of having cells to screen your cancer agents against. So, and this has been enormously beneficial for drug research. And as this plaque says in America, uh, Henrietta Lacks, who in death saved countless lives, is buried nearby. So the important thing was that biologists could screen compounds by learning to grow cancer cells in culture and keep them going. And here are the cells from Henrietta Lacks uh, in two very nice pictures. Here the DNA is shown in blue and here it's in orange. And there are filaments here coming out. These are, this is one cell here, and you can see them here. Perhaps not so well defined. Uh, these green filaments are called tubulin, and they're very important in the architecture of the cell, helping to keep its shape, but they're also very important in cell division. And uh, perhaps this won't work, but we'll see. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Probably isn't going to work today. Never mind, doesn't matter. <coughs> What's important is when cells divide, these filaments hold the chromosomes, the mother and daughter chromosomes, to form the new cell. So they're very important in the cycle of cell division. And because it happens very fast in cancer, if you hit these sites with drugs, then you can obviously attack cancer cells more than normal cells. And that's tubulin, and I'll come on to that later on. And here's the molecular structure of tubulin, and here's a drug you can see here sitting in this molecular structure. So we're moving on to structure-based drug design, which is the modern way of doing drug design. The idea that you can see how your drug interacts with its target. So the target is a 3D macromolecule, and your drug is a small chemical that you have designed to hit that molecule. Very powerful when coupled with library techniques and rapid assays, such as I've shown you. And we use X-ray, crystallography, or NMR to understand these structures. And here's uh, something from our own work. This is a molecule here, a big molecule uh, that has a hinge here. 
and this molecule opens and closes like that at this hinge. And we've designed our own molecule here and synthesized it to fit exactly in that hinge region and that keeps the molecule shut. And if the molecule is shut, then your drug is working. If it's open, it's not. So we've designed this to go in that space and I think it, it shows you very clearly the type of challenge you face. You have this site and you have to make something to fit in that site and do something different to the normal molecule. So if you know about the active site, we can target compounds to hit that active site. And here's an, another movie that we've made, which is very attractive, I think. We've solved the structure of the protein using X-ray crystallography. And what you see here is the active site of the protein. It doesn't matter what it is. This is one part here. This is one that's speeded up. So you, you can see the sheets of the protein and there are helices too, forming this big structure. And here's a drug that we've designed, nitrogen, chlorine, sulfur, oxygen, etc., benzene rings. doesn't matter what it's for. The point is that here it is moving into the active site, binding in the active site in a very specific way. And here it's slow and here it's fast, but you can see, very importantly, the protein is adapting. The molecule comes in and these side chains of amino acids in the active site are moving. The big molecule is flexing too. So it's not just a lock and key. It's not just a hand and glove. It's a dynamic interaction. It's a molecule hitting a target, but the target is moving in response to the molecule arriving. It's not a simple process. When we see our structures by X-ray, we're seeing a frozen structure. And that's not reality. You've got to be very careful what you do because you can be surprised. So we're in the realm of targeted therapy. We want to target our molecule against a certain protein to hit a certain disease that we know uh, is going to be important. I've talked about Gleevec, and here's this pioneering molecule bound to its protein target. This is a great compound that has revolutionized uh, chronic myeloid leukemia treatment over the years. We're trying to hit our target in whatever way we can. And in doing so, we'll be much more effective than normal cytotoxic chemotherapy. The patient will feel the benefit and will not be sick or have his hair fall out or all the horrible things. But we have to still identify good targets and we have to design the molecules to hit these targets. And these molecules have to be very clever molecules to actually be delivered to these targets. So I'm proposing that we should be much more engaged as academics in the science of drug discovery. We do most of the basic science. Industry has the money, but we do most of the basic science. So let's be more engaged in this whole process. I'm pleased to see the RSC has supported this idea in a statement of a few years ago, we should be combining the strengths of academia and industry in a positive interaction. But how can we translate these inventions from our benches in a university to a hospital bedside? Not only is that attractive in terms of patient care, it's now critically important for university funding. We've just had an exercise called the REF exercise, the Research Excellence Framework exercise. And this exercise has given out 20% of the evaluation of university research as part of two billion pounds per annum to all UK universities based upon impact. And impact is based upon what you achieve beyond academia. That's the important thing. An effect on change or benefit to the economy Society, culture, public policy, services, health, environment, or quality of life beyond academia. So if some professor reads your paper and thinks it's good, that's not good enough. What you have to have done is caused a change external to academia by your work. And if you do that and you can show that, then <coughs> the university gets more money to encourage this impact. So... 
whether we like it or not, and some people don't like it, we're now in the era of having to have impact. Universities have to justify their funding. They have to do good. And I think nobody would deny that discovering new drugs in a university, if you can, as we had the benefit of this article uh, a year or so ago, is something of impact. I think that points to impact that you can justify, and it also engages you in positive research, which is belonging in the university. It belongs there. It's clever research. It's good research. It's not just um, sort of uh, small-scale, uninteresting research. It's, it's clever research that has impact, and I think that's important. If you can do that, there's no doubt it will work as impact, and your university will get more money. So can this be done? It was done years ago, in the 1980s. Malcolm Stevens from Nottingham University, and now uh, he was at Aston, he discovered this drug, temozolomide, which is used for brain cancer. It's used now for brain cancer, and it was discovered at Aston University, and it was the first drug from a university that had a blockbuster sale. It reached a billion in sales. And this was great. And it was before the era where uh, university involvement was so critical as it is now. But it shows it can be done. Obviously, he did not take this drug all the way to phase three clinical trials. He had to engage a pharma company to share the risk. But he did the basic research that led to this drug working nowadays in brain cancer. So it's entirely possible to do this. But if you're thinking about industry academia interaction, you've got to be very careful. Universities fulfill a mission to train, to publish. They should not have commercial constraints. They should benefit society overall. A pharma company obviously has to make money for its shareholders. Uh, and what you may not realize, of course, is that academic science is a cutthroat environment. It's not genteel. Competition and reward is based upon the success of the individual engaged in curiosity-driven research. And here we're looking at the conflict between individualism and team science. In industry, you create a team. You create a team to achieve a certain goal. If you're a member of that team, if the team is successful, you're valued as a team member. In academia, you are primarily on your own. It's you and your research group doing this um, ivory tower research. So really, what we have to do if we're being successful in, in drug discovery, we have to value team science more in academia. And that's going to be very hard to do. Unfortunately, the culture isn't there. So I'm not sure how we're going to bridge this gap, but it must be bridged because we have to reward teams that work and are successful and not just individuals. So I'm just moving on now to our own work. And uh, I want to talk about uh, breast cancer, which is the area which we started off working in. It's obviously a terrible disease, a million new cases annually diagnosed, half a million deaths, 40,000 in the UK, <coughs> and most breast cancer patients are postmenopausal. And two-thirds of those are dependent upon steroid hormones. So if you have steroid hormones, they drive your breast cancer. So obviously that begs the question, let's not have these steroids, and that should be good. So steroids are organic molecules with four rings. Many of you will read these types of things and see the bad news about steroids, anabolic steroids, bodybuilding, <coughs> athletes, etc. But steroids are actually very, very important as messengers in the body. They all come from cholesterol, the structure here. And here's cholesterol as a ball and stick model and as a, uh, a space ring model here. So these steroids can be good and they can be bad. We have the estrogens, the female sex steroids, estrone, estradiol, and estriol. Estradiol is the most important 
the most active one. And in men, testosterone is an androgen, and that has a structure also, a four ring. It doesn't have this benzene ring here, as you can see. And in men, testosterone is a major driver of prostate cancer. So estradiol can drive breast cancer, testosterone can drive prostate cancer. So what you have to do is find some strategy to, to block these molecules binding to their target or block the way they're made. And then you have uh, a way of looking at breast cancer and possibly also prostate cancer. So a famous scientist, uh, George Beetson, was the father of anti-hormonal treatment. And he discovered, he was a surgeon, he published this paper in 1896. He discovered that in breast cancer patients, if he removed the ovaries of these patients, it was beneficial to their cancer. Their cancer regressed. So the ovaries were producing something which was driving the growth of this cancer. And of course, this was estrone and estradiol, the steroids. And now that's become a very important treatment for breast cancer to block estrone and estradiol. It's called endocrine therapy. How does this work? Here's a big macromolecule, as shown here, lots of helices, lots of sheets. You can see a molecule here bound. This is the estradiol receptor. This is the, the big molecule that binds estradiol and drives the growth of tumors. And it's a transcription factor. So what happens is when you activate this molecule, it binds to DNA. Here's DNA, here's the helix, and here's this uh, molecule bound to DNA. And it turns the DNA on so that the DNA undergoes transcription and produces protein. So obviously, if you can stop this happening, then you can stop the bad transcription happening and you might have some way of blocking proliferation of tumor cells. So estradiol binds to this molecule and it changes the shape so it can bind to DNA. Tamoxifen, which you may have heard of, is a drug against breast cancer, a very famous drug that saved countless thousands of lives, possibly millions of lives. When this drug binds to the same protein, the shape is different. And because the shape is different, it cannot stimulate uh, the transcription of DNA. So here's <coughs> basically how this works. You have to design something that binds to the same site as the natural compound, but is different and causes a different change, makes the molecule different so it doesn't work anymore. And then you have a drug. It's a fantastic drug. You can see here uh, a breast tumor which is quite large, and it's going into uh, neighboring tissue. And after treatment with tamoxifen, you can see it's almost gone. And here's tamoxifen as a structure here. So this is quite dramatic. Tamoxifen binds to the site which estradiol binds to and blocks the action of estradiol. So this is fine. It was the first targeted therapy for breast cancer. It's a gold standard. It works. But ultimately, patients still progress. So there's a need for new types of therapy working on a similar principle. And when we started our work, we found that it appears that estradiol is formed inside tumor cells. Tamoxifen will block circulating estradiol, but not estradiol inside tumor cells themselves. And this was a surprising thing. And the surprising thing was that this uh, compound is produced from inactive precursors. If you look at a breast tumor cell, it's shown here, and you stain it with an antibody for an enzyme called steroid sulfatase, everything comes up brown. Here's the cell. It's completely jam-packed, full of this enzyme, steroid sulfatase. Uh, and that's quite amazing. So here's our theory. Our theory is that uh, this inactive estrone sulfate, which is estrone with a sulfate group stuck on it, is transported into tumor cells. In the tumor cell, this sulfate group is cleaved off. 
to give this steroid by steroid sulfatase. That's then processed to give estradiol by changing this center here. Estradiol stimulates DNA synthesis and uh, cancer cell proliferation. So if you can block this, if you can block this enzyme here, you can block the growth of the cancer. So it's different to tamoxifen, it's interfering with the biosynthesis of estradiol. And I talked some time ago about genetics, very important. Here you can show that if you take biopsies of women who have breast cancer, you can measure the levels of this enzyme, steroid sulfatase. And what you see is the levels are very prognostic. If you have low levels of steroid sulfatase, your prognosis is good. This is relapse-free survival. This is overall survival. Your prognosis is okay. But if you have lots of steroid sulfatase, you see you're dying quite quickly. You're relapsing here and you're dying quicker than the other women. So here's a measure of success. If you treat women with high levels of steroid sulfatase with your drug, you will have success. If you treat those with low levels, it won't make much difference. So that's what you want to target, to stratify your patient population in the modern sense, to have a true targeted therapy. So our first clinical drug was this one. Um, we discovered this new uh, molecular entity uh, called the Aryl sulfonate pharmacophore. We created the first drug based upon estradiol. It was estrogenic, but we got that into uh, big clinical trials with a European pharma company as a prodrug for hormone replacement therapy. So the idea was you take this orally, this is clipped off, and then you have three estradiol working for hormone replacement therapy. So we got to six clinical trials. That was our first drug. And we found out, amazingly, that compounds with this motif are carried in red blood cells. So you take it orally, and it goes straight, 99%, into your red blood cells. And it's sequestered in a, a protein there called carbonic anhydrase. So here's our X-ray structure of this protein. And you can see this steroid sticking out of this hole here, which is the route to the active site. The active site is in the center of the protein. And this steroid is binding with our extra group here in the active site. And here's a tunnel where it sits to reach this active site. So amazingly, this drug is transported and protected from metabolism by red blood cells, and it emerges to do its job at a later date. So that allowed us to uh, transform our estrogenic drug into a nicer one. And that's this drug here called irosistat, which you can see looks similar uh, shown down here in comparison, it looks similar and therefore you can imagine it binding to the same site, the same biological macromolecules, but this is a non-steroidal compound and this was our first anti-cancer drug. Uh, we, we, we made the front page of a, uh, a good chemical journal here, here's our drug, this is called irosistat or SDX64 and here's the x-ray structure, you can see it's got three rings, it's got this sulfonate group here, there's sulfur and nitrogen, and it's got a big C ring here. And here's the packing in the crystal that we can look at by X-ray crystallography. It's also called BN83495. We can use computational chemistry to understand this as well. Here's our target. This is steroid sulfatase, and we know that this blocks the binding site for the normal substrate, and you can model that in. You see here in orange, here's our drug sticking here, and it puts this sulfamate group right opposite an amino acid in the active site. And the theory is that this then hops across and it blocks that, and the enzyme is inactivated. And we've shown this is the case using a bacterial enzyme. This is a bacterial enzyme from uh, Pseudomonas, 
It's a, a soluble sulfatase, and we can grow crystals here of this enzyme in complex with our drug. These are lovely crystals here. You can then look at it by X-ray crystallography. And you can see the active site. Here's the active site of that enzyme. And we can see new electron density here where our drug, part of our drug molecule has hopped across and it stuck itself on this residue here in the active site. And in doing so, it's blocked the enzyme from working. So now we understand how this works. Does it work on tumors? Yes, it does. Uh, here are tumors growing very fast. And here, after treatment with our drug, you see the tumor growth is blocked. Here are tumors that have been resized after treatment with our drug. And here are tumors that have grown without treatment of the drug. So it works. It's orally active. So how do we get from a great idea in a university, which normally ends here and starts to be of interest to pharma here, to patients? How do we get to translational research? How do we get, we learn about efficacy and how it works in patients? Can we do that? Well, first of all, you have to have a patent. You have to protect your intellectual property. You have to be able to show that if someone invests money in your idea, they can make a profit because they can sell the drug and be protected. So you have to have a US patent, a European patent. Uh, and we made many, many filings in our time, uh, 770 patent filings overall. Uh, an enormous job and very, very expensive. And here are two of our patents, one in the USA and one in Europe. And these gave us a stranglehold over the area. Very important because once the news gets out, big pharma with its millions and millions of pounds to spend muscles in and steals your idea. So that's called the Me Too approach. So you publish your data, you publish your patent as an academic, you'll be steamrolled by big pharma just taking over your project and beating you hands down. But we were very lucky here because our patents were so strong, they couldn't do that. Here's an example. Here are all the compounds that Big Pharma made based upon our work. You can see a whole variety of structures. They all have similar motifs, and they're all patents. So very frightening. Once you have a discovery, you have to protect it, and you have to protect it very strongly. And all the big companies took over uh, and tried to beat us at our own game. So we have a great idea. We've shown it works. It looks fantastic. How do we get across the valley of death? And the valley of death is a common term <coughs> in the business startup world. How do you cover the early stage negative cash flow? Who puts in the millions and millions of pounds to cross this chasm here? Because that's what you have to do to get to patients you have to cross this chasm, and you have to spend millions and millions of pounds in doing so. And in doing so, you're putting your millions and millions of pounds at severe risk, because as I've told you, only one in 10 clinical programs will work. So a chasm has opened up between biomedical researchers and the patients who need their discovery. So what we did was we adopted a spin-out model we, the two universities who invented this technology, joined together. We transferred our patents into a company called Sterix Limited. This company had these types of remits here. And we used a university business model during this period. We then funded work in the two universities. So we had a company that was spun out. That company then funded work in the two universities at a very basic level. And I'm very proud that overall, uh, our company, Sterix, returned 28 million to the UK university sector uh, over a number of years in direct research contracts with overheads. At its peak, uh, Sterix employed 40 research scientists. So it was quite a, uh, a serious undertaking. Had a big turnover, it benefited universities, and it also uh, employed 40 people. So how do we navigate the valley of death? We're still doing so now. We're still in the valley of death. We're not there yet because it's a big valley. We're about here, perhaps, at the moment. We're still needing this investment. 
we haven't yet got to here and, and have a marketed product that benefits patients. Here's a few examples over the years from the 90s to 2010. You can see we've done this by raising very large amounts of money, either by earning the money through licensing our patent or by getting venture capitalists to invest in our company or uh, signing freedom to operate licenses to various companies in Japan or elsewhere. And finally, we work as an academic industry partnership. We sold our company to a big pharma company in 2004, and that big pharma company then gave University of Bath and, and Imperial College London 8.3 million in research contracts to carry on the work. But it took over the development side of our drug. It paid for the very, very costly further clinical development. So these are the kinds of sums you have to do. You have to raise this kind of money just to get into the valley of death and start to, to earn your keep as a drug discoverer. It's very hard indeed. So this actually summarizes the company progress. In the 90s, we had our idea. We were academics in a university. We had the spin-out biotech model here. Uh, we were then funded by venture capitalists. We then sold our company to a major pharma company who took over further trials. And in that period, we were able to carry out these clinical trials on a variety of different types of cancers with our drugs. And now we're trying to spin out a new company with the University of Oxford and Bath, funded by ISIS Innovation called Estrix Pharma. So we're still in the valley of death. We've proven an enormous <coughs> amount with our drugs, but we're not out of the danger zone yet. Just uh, very briefly, uh, we saw some great results with our drug. Uh, we did a first-in-class trial in a university in Imperial College London uh, of our drug in women with advanced breast cancer. And we saw very gratifyingly that when you take biopsies of these tumors and measure steroid sulfatase, our target, after five milligrams or 20 milligrams, we've wiped out the target completely. Fantastic. So drug is taken orally, it goes to the tumors, and it wipes out the target. Uh, does it work on the tumors? Well, here's a lady who had a very big metastatic lesion from her breast cancer, and this was halted after treatment with our drug. And several patients in this first trial showed stable disease for up to seven months. So that was very exciting indeed. We'd finally seen, we'd taken something from the bench, we'd taken it into patients at enormous cost, uh, not just intellectual cost, but also financial cost, and we saw beneficial results for real cancer patients. And that was shown to be true by a subsequent trial in 35 patients carried out by our pharma partner. Just recently, 2013, we had this uh, report in the Daily Mail because we've got some new trials going on in Liverpool, combining our drug with another known drug to see if it, it works synergistically to give a better result, and that's being carried out by this clinician here, also in cooperation with Charles Coombs at Imperial College. So this is very exciting. We hope to see results from this trial coming through, hopefully sometime this year. We also got our first drug into clinical trial against endometriosis. Endometriosis is a, a very painful, non-cancerous disease whereby implants which are driven by estradiol, uh, implant themselves throughout the pelvic cavity. And they're horrible things like this, which are very, very painful, and they work in a cyclical fashion like the menstrual cycle because they're stimulated by estradiol. And uh, many, many women have a great deal of pain through this disease. And we showed that this disease is characterized by very high levels of steroid sulfatase. So if we can block this enzyme, we should be able to help women with endometriosis. And indeed, uh, our first phase one trials showed that even at four milligrams per week, we could reduce this steroid sulfatase by 91%. We've got the drug in trials now in Eastern Europe and results hopefully at the phase two level to be ready soon. 
So we've achieved over the years 19 clinical trials on several drugs, all discovered in a university. Breast cancer up to phase two. We have combination trials going on. Endometrial cancer, which I haven't mentioned, we've also completed phase two. We saw there more stable disease than the current standard of care. That was very exciting. Endometriosis, phase two is in progress. And we even treated men. We've even treated men with prostate cancer up to phase one and hope to get to phase two soon because this compound here is uh, a precursor of testosterone that I've told you drives prostate cancer. So if you can block the enzyme steroid sulfatase that cleaves off this group here, you can block the formation of testosterone and hopefully have a treatment for prostate cancer. We also now know that uh, this idea has potential in ovarian cancer and also in bladder cancer. Very exciting. Just um, in the last uh, few minutes or so, our third drug, which we hope to get to clinical trial, is shown here. This is called STX140, and it's a modification of a natural compound which is based on estradiol called 2-methoxyestradiol. What we've done is added our groups onto various parts of the molecule and made it a much better compound, an orally active multi-targeting agent that I think is going to be very successful against hormone-independent cancer. So cancer which is not driven by hormones. It's a harder type of cancer to treat. Here's a cell which is a hormone-independent cancer cell. You can see the tubulin here that I pointed out before, the nucleus. After treatment with our drug, it's very, very unhappy indeed. It's about to die. It's been sent on a death pathway by just putting this compound on the cell. So we have to <laughs> achieve that in a targeted fashion in the body, and we're very excited about it. One other way of treating cancer is to block the blood supply to the cancer. Cancers need nutrients to grow. They're fed by blood vessels that carry the nutrients. If you can attack the blood vessels linking the cancer, then you may be able to cause the cancer to shrink. And our drug does that. Here's a healthy vasculature shown here. And here, after treatment with our drug, you can see it's in a very bad way. It's dying. It's very unhappy. So this drug is an anti-angiogenic drug. It hits the blood vessels that feed cancers. So it blocks the proliferation of the cancer cells and also the way they get their nutrients. And just uh, graphically, you can see here, here are hormone-independent cells growing, and after treatment with our drug, complete flatlining. So we've completely stopped the growth of these tumors. In fact, in these experiments, we've caused complete cures of cancers in uh, several cases. And here, it even works against drug-resistant cancer. Here's our red line after treatment with our compound. But it doesn't work with docetaxel. So very exciting, and we hope to get that into trial quite soon. Uh, we published our results, and the newspapers uh, were quite enthusiastic. You can see here a few examples. The Frinton and Walton Gazette. <laughs> the Clacton Gazette. <laughs> Curing Death Com and the Daily Star, but also some serious papers as well. They were all very interested in the idea, uh, and it was great to see this in the press. But there's a sting in the tail. It wasn't all a great experience. The Daily Express published a picture of a lady in her kitchen taking our pill. Now, of course, our pill didn't exist. Our work was academic work published in an academic journal, we have a drug, but it's not yet at the state of being taken as a pill. So this was a complete fabrication. It was very complimentary, which is very nice, but obviously this is invented. And when you work in academia, you can proofread your articles. You can control what's published. When you talk to journalists, you cannot control what they publish or what they do. So this is a good example of the bad side. So what happens, of course, is people ring up, who have cancer and say, I want your drug. And we have to say, sorry, it doesn't yet exist in a way that you can take it. 
And that's pretty awful. Even Metro ran something on our compound. And I'm told that getting to Metro is the gold standard of journalism. And they called it Kill Pill. Once again, they assumed there was a pill, even though there wasn't. So, you know, it's great to have this publicity. It's great to be recognized, but there's a sting in the tail. It's not always good when the journalists get hold of your story. The Sun ran something quite nice, all very good, until you get to the bottom line. Boffins now hope to run the trial on humans. Now, if they were in the pharma industry, would they be boffins? I think it's because we're in a university, we're boffins. We can't take us seriously. We're bald-headed, bespectacled professors, but wearing white coats. But once again, at least this was okay. At least it wasn't too over the top. But we are boffins. So in the last five minutes now, I'm sorry to go on so long, um, we're in a crisis. Big Pharma is in a crisis. We have to find new ways of discovering drugs. They're too expensive. It's too hard. We need a different business model. We need complementary and sustainable funding, and we need pub participation from the public sector. It's very important. Not just big pharma doing its work. We have to have wider funding. So we need a triumvirate of big pharma, small biotech, and medium-sized companies working together with universities, all in a partnership. This is going to be quite hard to do, just like forming the coalition tomorrow will also be very hard to do, depending on what happens. Also, chemistry drives drug discovery. The government has to provide more funding to support chemistry. So there's something here which is very important, which is that we have to take new steps to work together, to have personal chemistry across boundaries. We need uh, investment from government, academia, non-profit organizations such as charities like the Wellcome Trust, biotech companies. We need open innovation models and new partnerships to help fund this big enterprise. And here's a quote from the National Institute for Health Research, which uh, distributes a billion pounds a year for academic research in the NHS. Culture change is needed. We must work more openly with each other and the life sciences industry. Academics have world-class knowledge of mechanisms, and often pharma companies have assets but don't understand mechanisms. The old model of academics on one side and industry on the other is outmoded. We must be more collaborative. We must have a cultural change. I think that's a very really strong message to, to deliver here. And here, the world is responding. We have partnerships now between universities and companies. Here are a few worldwide partnerships that have been uh, starting up over the last year in 2014. The world's taking notice. Companies are banding together with academia and trying to work together, even though there's a culture difference and there are big problems in doing so. So our university is the future of drug discovery. Well, you go back beyond this era of need, and this study here published in the Telegraph last year said that nearly a quarter of 252 drugs approved in the US between 1997 and 2005 were actually discovered in universities, probably given to companies by the licensing mode. And that's now possibly a bit harder to do. But more importantly, the university-developed drugs outperformed those that had come from industry for real innovation. There's a very strong message. Innovation is a watchword of universities. We should play to that, and they can help solve the crisis that we're faced by the lack of innovation in the pharma industry. So there are new models happening, open innovation here, a world first, an agreement between uh, AstraZeneca, the MRC, and academic researchers gave academics access to 22 drugs from this company, which could be repurposed. Academics could find new ways of using these drugs that were highly advanced 
with the help of the Medical Research Council. This is a new way of working and it's fantastic. It's encouraging uh, via the mediation of MRC <coughs> industry to communicate with academia. And that's now expanded in 2014 to seven companies doing this on a global basis, a new partnership. All these companies are taking part, giving some of their deprioritized molecules to academics to use to try and find new uses for them. So repurposing good compounds is important and allows academics to play a, a key role in drug discovery, but with advanced compounds. Some universities, such as my own, are taking bigger steps. Here's the new Oxford Drug Discovery Institute, which has just agreed, as has Cambridge and UCL, a big deal with the Alzheimer's Research UK charity, 30 million Drug Discovery Alliance launching these centres, very important. And uh, with this charity, obviously, there's great hope that new drugs can be developed against Alzheimer's. University College London has a different attitude. We're not spinning out things here, we're spinning them in. And I don't know whether there's a certain arrogance here, but challenges too big for Big Pharma can be tackled in a university setting. That's a big statement. You can't put a thousand people in a glass tower and say discover something. Discovery occurs in the university. That's true. So what they're doing is spinning in the commercial know-how to build a life sciences business into the university. They're keeping control of everything. They're not spinning it out. They're working in UCL with commercial expertise and life science people to try and build essentially a pharma company inside a university. That sounds a bit risky to me, but it may work. So we believe because we're in the university that we can outthink the problem in a way big pharma cannot do. So in conclusion, universities should keep to basic, innovative, curiosity-driven research. They should be able to access a secondary translational track to exploit their work in cooperation with people who have the experience to do so, because they can't beat the odds. The odds are very bad, and even a university cannot beat those odds. So there should be no competition with industry, but something working together with them and keeping innovation very high. Integrated centers are required by which all these partnerships can come together and work together in a team. And a variety of stakeholders are required to support this venture. So universities can discover drugs, they can develop them, perhaps via the biotech model, perhaps via licensing, but probably the best route is by new types of partnerships. The fiction is that they, can't, they can do this on their own. They can't do it alone. They can get to the early stages. They can get to phase two trials, perhaps like we have with the aid of a biotech company, but <coughs> we can't beat the odds. The odds are very bad for anyone, but the more people put their heads together, the more chance we have of beating those odds. So adaptation, collaboration, and partnership, new and diverse funding models, these are all key things for continued discovery of new drugs. And future stakeholders include government, academia, charities, philanthropists, perhaps even crowd, crowdfunding, social investors, and commercial sources. But the telling thing is that all of us, as we know, is at some stage a patient. So everyone in this area is a stakeholder. We all have a big interest in making sure that these new models, whatever they are, work. Otherwise, we're going to see a big crisis in access to drugs in coming decades. So drug discovery is a team effort. It's always a team effort wherever you are. Here are some of the fantastic team that I've worked with over the years. Chemists, biologists, uh, medics, all working together in, in a quasi-academic environment to try and do their best to improve patient care. 
I want to pick out one member of the team very significantly. This is Mike Reed here, my very close colleague for a number of years, for about 20 years. Uh, um, sadly, Mike Reed died in 2009 and has been unable to share in the successes that have come from many, many years of hard work since the 1990s. So that's a very sad thing, but his legacy will live on, hopefully, as our drugs progress across the valley of death. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and patience and to dedicate this lecture to the memory of Mike. Thank you very much. Barry, for that uh, beautifully clear and far-ranging talk and uh, perhaps indeed the uh, new dawn for drug discovery. So we have time for a few questions. Um, we have microphones which will come around, so please wait for them to come around uh, if you are called. Who would like to start us off, please? Yes, in the front here. I'm that's I'm that's one point. Again, and okay. at the University of Oxford, the Cambridge Department of Studies, and I was talking... Uh, sorry. Uh, my name's Greenslade. I'm a retired academic for about 20 years. Uh, the university I was in, the chemistry department, closed. Uh, at about the same time, others closed. And, of course, at uh, Sussex, they were going to close the chemistry department and start up chemical biology. And as a, a distinguished Cambridge chemist said to me, he wrote to the vice chancellor and pointed out you couldn't really have chemical biology without chemistry. So uh -huh. I th I, I, do you think that perhaps the model of universities, of departments is perhaps wrong and that maybe one should have a model where there are uh, uh, teaching areas controlled by a teaching manager and research groups which run from a, uh, a dean of science or dean of engineering whatever uh, a vice chancellor for research that in fact we associate the teaching with the department and the research with the department and that actually causes a lot of the problems. Well, most, I think most universities think that research informs teaching and it's very important that researchers do teach because they can yeah. impart their enthusiasm to undergraduates. And so you, if yeah. you compartmentalise them too much, you're in big danger of yeah, I, I, throwing I, out the baby I'm with the bathwater. Yeah. I wasn't suggesting that. I was suggesting that you just simply have these, you would have overlapping groups. But the, the teaching and the research, in a sense, you would get teams in research and teams in teaching, and they would overlap because uh, the people in each group would belong to both groups, but they would be organised in a slightly different way. Well, that could be a useful thing to try out. But, you know, as we all know, and people say all the time, managing academics is like herding cats. It's a well-known <laughs> phrase in universities. Just try and manage academics and make them do something away from their individual interests, which is what I was trying to get at. They hate it. They can't work in teams. They can't have a, a unified spirit. And they're not rewarded for doing so. That's the problem. Uh, they're rewarded for being individuals and having fun, which is great. And you've got to maintain that. If you turn universities into drug discovery companies, you've lost big time. That mustn't happen. And what's happening, I think, is that uh, universities are being told you should now get into translational research. And they all want to do that. It's the wrong route. We shouldn't be doing that. We should be doing the clever stuff. We can't beat the odds. They're very, very bad. We should let the experts work on those areas. And we do the clever things and hopefully get the clever drugs that might have a chance of success. But very tough to do. Managing university staff is awfully difficult. Next piece, yes, thank you at the back. Uh, <coughs> I'm talking uh, as a layperson here, so I apologise in advance if it's, uh, if it's a ridiculous question. But what I, just talking at, generally at the beginning where you say that uh, the chemist can design molecules to a uh, attach or to target a, uh, a specific protein, what I don't understand is where the physiology of the system comes in, in terms of drug action, surely that has to come from the complex system of biology. And so I'm not quite sure how that 
a particular protein which may be in a tumor cell or, or some part of the body may not actually be in many other places for which we don't want the target uh, molecule That's right. to well, eat. It's never as clear cut as it seems and perhaps I explained it too simplistically. But there's different types of doing this work. Obviously you have uh, targeted therapy where you hit your protein, you have it in vitro and you try and see if your drug works and then you hope that it will work in a systemic fashion in cells or you have phenotypic screening where, whereby you look at the whole cell and you look at the compound that works on the whole cell and you hope that has an effect. We have to work in cooperation with these two extremes, I think. Um, you have to hope that your targeted therapy will work, but you also have to bear in mind the more old-fashioned approach of phenotypic screening has a big track record of success as well. And it's too dangerous to say that it's easy to solve. It never is easy to solve. This is a very complex thing. And I think we see from systems biology, of course, that you, know, you, you can't just change one thing and expect a cure. Um, and that's true in terms of cancer cell physiology too, because you hit one target, something else is upregulated, and that overcomes what you've done. So the world is moving now towards the idea that hitting one target on its own <coughs> is not enough. You've actually got to hit several targets and stop the way the cell can adapt to what you're trying to do. And that's going to be the clever way of doing it. In fact, the targeted drugs that we've seen that have been so successful normally work in combination with radiotherapy or chemotherapy as well. It's quite rare they work totally alone. So in a way, that's a bit of disappointment, but I guess that's the way it is. And you can't find a, a magic bullet that's always perfect. Yes, please, sort of in the middle. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for an interesting talk. You touched briefly upon antibiotic resistance. Um, and I think it's pretty widely known now that there's, there are big problems ahead of us probably with these multi-antibiotic resistant microorganisms. However, it strikes me that there's not much of an incentive to big pharma to deal with this, partly because of the costs, as you said, but in this particular case of, of a a drug company came out with a superb new antibiotic, it wouldn't be used. It would be kept in reserve for, for the special cases. They would sell very little of it. And they're in the business of making money, clearly. So unless there's some external funding for it, I, know. I don't see where it's going to come from. That's why you need people like the Wellcome Trust and other people to step in and, and add money to the equation. The big partnerships are going to have to happen in order to do this because the companies on their own will not see it as profitable enough to do it. That's why they haven't done anything since the 1980s. There haven't been any new classes discovered. It's not been profitable to do that. So there's some big things need to be done um, and some big thinking needs to be done because um, there's no simple way of doing this. And I think the money will have to come from other sources, just from companies on their own. And I think the US government sees that and is already pouring money into that area. But they're doing it perhaps by extending the patent life that you can have things like that to make it more profitable if you discover something, but perhaps not putting the money in on the nail. But there are ways, incentives have to be produced to, to try and overcome these blocks, as you say, because it's a, a dire problem at the moment. And you can't just snap your fingers and have a new compound. It takes years. So what happens? You know, we're going to be out of antibiotics quite soon. It's terrifying. Right, yes, please, thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I was going to pick up on the patent life um, that you talk about. Isn't there not a flip side that it's the patents that are there in order to try and recoup the money in the drug development that is then making those drugs unattractive for NHS and other health systems to take up and be put to the larger population? Because then <coughs> when they come off patent, the compounds themselves are much cheaper to be made. That's right. And yeah. then they can be sold at a much cheaper price. So then that's when they can get into the larger population and help the patients that the drugs have been designed for. But it's the patents that's, in a way, preventing that. Well, at the heart of the new model, there's this thing called open innovation, which claims you don't need patents. I don't think that's the case. I think my colleague here, probably with, who's a patent agent, might object to that. But 
There are people going around saying we should discover drugs and they should be openly available to everyone. But who makes the money to make them um, exist? Who puts the 100 million in to produce the phase three trials to make sure they work? It's a very difficult equation to balance. And I think the best thing is to have a mix of all these things. And as I said towards the end, all these models are arising, they have to prove their worth. And who knows what will come to the top of the tree over time. I, th I think that there are lots of harbingers of, of no more patents going round. I think they're working in a pretty difficult area, personally. I think it's going to be quite tough when you get to the really big trials that need to be done, how that's, how that's funded, with no profit motive at all. Perhaps just a couple more questions, if you have the time, please. Oh, sorry, I'm not going to disappoint some people. Uh, yes, please, thank you. Thanks again for a uh, smashing talk. Um, <coughs> you mentioned quite a lot of, uh, well, several times it came up, the interdisciplinary nature of making this work. You, I mean, there's chemistry, and we've always made fun, as physicists, which I am, about the chemists and so on, and it's a nice yeah. picture. You mentioned X-ray crystallography as telling you the shapes of these things, but without the physics, you can't do that, I guess. How, how can you make sure, or how can you optimise in these new models that you, you're you aware of the new physics or whether it's biology, physics, either end of the spectrum, that you're catching hold of the new techniques, uh, processes and procedures that allow you to do the equivalent of, oh, X-ray crystallography, I can get the shape, I can now look for keys. Well, there are tons of techniques going on. I mean, there have been so many advances in X-ray crystallography, you can now do it as a routine tool. Mm -hmm. In my early days, it was a wonderful thing to have a crystal structure. Amazing, years of work. And now there are companies that do 300 crystal structures in one program. And they take a molecule and they grow it in the active site. So you take a molecule, a small fragment, you take a snapshot of that binding to your molecule, uh, and then you add a bit more on and you see how that binds. And you can do it in a dynamic fashion very fast and build your molecule in the active site from fragments. There's a very successful company doing that called Aztex. Um, very exciting. And it's all to do with advances in X-ray crystallography technology, allowing these things to be done on a rapid scale. So yes, I mean, physics, despite what I said, has a role to play too. It's, it's how to get all of those different techniques, which may have been developed for entirely different reasons. Indeed, uh, Blue Horizon, physics research might be coming up with a technique which <coughs> in five years time you guys will be using and you don't even know each other exists so you'll know that how, do you, how do you get together you'll know that because you need antibiotics you need drugs you'll be driven to find people that you can help because it's a big crisis you've got to do this we can't be in our silos and just say we're doing this and you're doing that we've all got to talk to each other and the Nobel Prize last year was a good example of that really good example and it has to be done. So yes, the boundaries are falling away, hopefully. And even the snobbish academic <laughs> people have to recognize that and stop getting out of their ivory towers and start talking to you, for example. If I could just raise a more strategic question, perhaps, Barry. Um, we hear a lot of talk, you mentioned this concept of the undruggable target, but is that really right? Or does it mean we're simply looking at it the wrong way because we're too hidebound by our previous approaches? I think so, yeah. I mean, the idea is obviously that I've presented a kind of utopian view that you can do it, but in fact it's very, very hard. And the best ideas still come from informed luck. I hate to say it, but they still come from informed luck based upon good judgment. So looking in the right area, you know, you've got to have the informed mind, but you've still got to be open to things happening that you didn't predict. If it was all just an intellectual endeavour, it would be much, much easier but it isn't. So there are all kinds of things like undruggable targets to work with, and it's, it's the universities that should be doing this. They should be looking at these very difficult targets. Industry won't do it. They won't take the risk. Universities must take the risk and look for innovation and the tough things. And that's how the partnerships will progress, I think. They shouldn't go soft and just go for the easy targets. Well, they've they've all gone anyway, as I said, they've all gone. 
the easy targets have gone. You've got to have the hard ones, and that takes a lot of, of, of endeavour to try and make those work. Just one more, please. I think that the lady on the right here, thank you. Hello, thank you for a very interesting and informative talk. My name's Judy. Um, I'll call myself a layperson. Um, I found it very interesting about the yew tree being um, the basics um, for breast cancer. Uh, sorry if my terminology is not right, but you'll get my gist. Um, is it then not possible to start growing yews? People don't realize how important this tree is, both leaves and berries. And if the government knows that this is a, a great medicinal value, um, can we not look to the future? Or is it um, as cheap, cheaper to go the scientific way of reproducing it through the means that you've shown us today? I mean, all around in, in England, I've got so many yew trees in my garden, and I must say, I was very, very sad. <laughs> this is true case that an 80, 90-year-old yew tree was cut only a few months ago, and this made me very sad. But I'm just, you know, thinking in general, every churchyard's got yew trees. Um, could we not, therefore, um, grow them for the future? Well, there's one in Somerset that's 4,000 years old, I understand. So... Yeah, yes. Uh, um, you know, um, I if, mean, these, if these natural things have yes. evolved all kinds of molecules over millennia to deal with threats. And these molecules have been filtered down through all kinds of evolutionary constraints to work in certain ways. And they're very, very powerful. There's no doubt. Uh, and you can't just say, well, that drug, Taxol, in fact, um, well, I don't know. You can't take it orally. It's not perfect. It's, it's not the best thing in the world by any means, but it works. And there are plenty of examples of, of natural products which actually may not pass current guidelines if they were discovered now. But what you're saying is we've got to keep our minds open, we've got to look at natural sources all the time, and Mother Nature is a great therapist. Um, I don't know whether the U has been exhausted in terms of potential. It's been thoroughly examined, as you can see, um, but who knows? Take yew leaves, extract them with alcohol or solvent, put them on these cell lines that you can get, and who knows? I think if you look at them by chromatography, you'll see there are thousands and thousands of compounds in there. One of those could be the next drug. It takes some patience to try and find out. <coughs> okay, well I think we'll give the time really must uh call a halt there but thank you very much indeed Barry for a really super talk and thank you for your very interesting uh, and wide ranging questions too and I'm sure you all wish Barry the very best of luck as he prepares to start his lecture tour this autumn for year 2015-16. Thank you all very much for your attendance this evening. Thank you. <laughs>